Tesla's humanoid robot Optimus might very well be the most important product ever for humanity. Are Tesla's Gen 2 and upcoming Gen 3 versions ready for scaling, or will there be hardware challenges that limit rapid scaling? What are the breakthroughs in AI, motors, and design that are important to follow? And most importantly, how big could this get for Tesla investors today? James, so, uh, what's your answer to the question of like Gen 2 and the upcoming Gen 3? What's your I, I take a much kind of broader view of the like the fact that they're shutting down the the line for a couple of months is like it's not surprising it's not alarming uh you know they are going to go through a lot of design generations before they get stuff that is inexpensive uh mass producible and highly reliable. And so the, all of the processes that Scott's describing right now, they're the kinds of things you do early on when you're trying to get the thing working and you're trying to explore the design space. They're not the kinds of things you do when you start going to like high volume manufacturing. So kind of unsurprisingly, prototype processes have various kinds of constraints. And Tesla, they, they, they're they going to have to decide if they want to continue with this process, because it's it's going to be a stopgap in any case. I mean, you're not going to CNC machine these things when you get to, you know, millions of robots a year. It's not not practical to do it at that kind of scale. If you're making something inexpensive, CNC machining also it's not good for making inexpensive stuff. Different manufacturing processes are used when you get to volume. So. Tesla's building prototypes, even if they're building thousands of prototypes, they're still building prototypes. And so any, you know, problems that they run into at this stage, they don't really say anything about the long arc of the program. They don't say anything about whether the design is successful or not. It's, you know, it's a, the, uh, many of these, you know, mechanical designs, technologies and supply chains are things where there's not, uh, there isn't an adjacent market for, uh, for an actuator that works great in some other high volume application that you can just adopt and move over. Humanoid robots are, they're kind of an interesting manufacturing space in that but there's very little stuff that you can carry across from a mechanical design standpoint from other, like you can't bring a lot of stuff over from automobiles. You can't bring a lot of stuff over from printers. You can't bring a lot of stuff over from like industrial robots or, you know, other stuff. Like all this stuff has to be made. So, do, you know, figuring out, you know, the best, cheapest way to do each individual part that goes in and every single part in the robot is going to have to go through this process. And they're going to go through 10 generations, 25 generations of these things before they really get where they're going. So it's not, you know, the, we, there's no market in, in Optimus at the end of this year. There's probably no market in Optimus at the end of next year, even when they've got 10,000 robots, you know, Tesla will be exercising them inside to try to understand how the designs work to they'll be you know iterating on the manufacturing line to try to come up with better manufacturing stuff so uh you know it's the, the it's there's a long term this is a really important market uh long term it's a really important technology but it's we're early days on this stuff we're still really far away from um the promise of the technology uh and and the reason we're far away it's not it's because there's a ton of stuff going into this that there's no adjacent market that you can steal parts from or you can steal processes from. They're really having to develop a lot more stuff from scratch here. But this is one of the reasons why I think Tesla's the right company to do it, right? Because there is, I mean, they do vertical integration like nobody's business, right? I mean, they will get right down into the material science and necessary to solve something. They're not they're not constrained to, oh, let's find the guy who knows how to do this. They're, they're, they're very much, and they will figure out how to do it. And building humanoid robots has a lot more, you got to figure it out than it has, I'm going to buy this from somebody else in it. So I think this is all just to be expected. And we're going to see it again and again as they, you know, uh, work their way through maturing the design and maturing the manufacturing process to be able to do it. Do you disagree, Scott? No, no, I, I agree. Is that um, a, a lot of things look very similar to what you have out there? It's like, oh, it's going to need chips. It's not going to need cameras and everything else. In terms of it, well, the cameras they need aren't exactly the same as the cameras you're putting everywhere else. So, it's some similarities. Uh, again, the motors. Everyone just assumes, oh, we can just take drone motors and repurpose them and change them a little bit. It's, like, <laughs> uh, it's a little, little bit more there yeah, than no, that. So. And you know, then we we have. 
kind of these things, and, and I, I'd really like to ask James's opinion on this because the impression I've been getting, and this is something that Jim Fan mentioned back in January, is the, the importance of design for simulation. That um, if you want to use RL, it, it really helps to design a bot that's easy to simulate. And it turns out the, uh, the Optimus is not that easy to simulate in RL, mainly because of all the linear drives that are in there. But, but that's, that's not how it's going to work with humanoids, mm -hmm. though, especially when they try to get to volume. Because you're, you're not going, like if you optimize for making it really easy to simulate, you're mm -hmm. optimizing for the wrong thing. What Tesla will do is they will, they will not optimize for easy to simulate. They will optimize for the right design, and then they will require the simulator guys to eat it, <laughs> like make a better <laughs> simulator, right? That's that's mm -hmm. how it's going to go, because you don't want to optimize. I mean, if you're a researcher, right, which is that's that's Jim Fan's thing, you mm -hmm. want to spend your time working on the interesting parts of the problem, right? And and you know the the it, in in his case, the simulator, I guess from his perspective, that's not the interesting part of the problem. He wants to work on, you know, the algorithms that you need for training the robots to be able to do sophisticated motions and link those to planning systems and all of that kind of stuff, right? So he wants to get the simulator out of there. But if you're, you know, going, if you're a manufacturer and you're looking to go to volume, you don't get the simulator out of there. Like that simulator, that is your friend. You want the best possible simulator, but you don't want the simulator you don't want to design your system around your simulator. You want to design your simulator around your system, right? Yeah, and and I would sort of agree with that because, uh, you know, having been in the simulation space myself uh, for 40 years and doing with industrial robots, you know, we certainly took a, in the early days a very simplistic view on how the, the robot mechanism was, was put together and we just focused on where the joints were and we weren't looking at the actuation and it turns out you had to model the actuation to get the proper movement of the robot, that characteristic in there. That's something we learned very, very early. So we had to go and modify our simulator to, to be much better to be able to deal with those kinds of scenarios. Um, when you start turning on physics, physics is messy. It's really hard to do, requires a lot of calculation. So the simpler you can make the models going in there, the easier it will be. And so if you can make your robot nothing but you know joints that are made up of actuators, everything just becomes a lot easier and you can start, you know, getting a robot to do backflips and everything else will be really, really impressive. Um, but again, you're right. It's, it's, it will take a while to get there. And my impression with Isaac Sim and having seen some of the simulations that are in there, especially like with mm -hmm. uh, the agility bot, which has a lot of backlinks and everything else moving in there. When it was moving around, it didn't seem like those things were staying connected correctly. And, and that was just kind of like, uh, you know, why aren't you mastering that? <laughs> That's a part of, of the robot anatomy, the way it needs to be uh, physically simulated, right? And, and Tesla is not using Isaac Sim. Obviously, everything they, they have is built in-house. Mm -hmm. So they had to build everything. And I'm sure Optimus, the current design, became a real challenge for them to be able to get that correctly. And that's why there was that radio silence for four months. Is it was like a really hard problem, probably a little bit harder yeah. than they expected. And then eventually I mean, they yeah. mastered it, and now you know they're able to 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 put the data in there and uh, you know get zero shot, which is, <laughs> is is definitely quite impressive when you have a mechanism that that that, that complicated to be able to do the training and then expect it you know, the first time to actually be able to master it. So that tells something about both. The, the way they've modeled the actuators that they actually know how to physically model them for the simulation and the simulator itself. It, so I don't think, I think it's unlikely that they're using a full resolution electromagnetic simulation of the model as part of the RL training algorithm, right? They're going to, uh, they're going to use that, mo they're going to use that model to design the actuator because you want to make a really good actuator that's as close to ideal as possible. And then you're going to use that simulator to generate like a parameterized approximation to the model, something something that you can reduce to a relatively small set of parameters, or maybe a neural network, you know, a neural network plugin module that basically tells you what the transfer function is for that thing. I mean, all the transfer functions, not just the electromechanical, but back EMF and all that kind of stuff. You want a really good model for all of that stuff, and you want to be able to put that thing into your RL model. But at the end of the day, uh, I mean, we know there's a bunch of sim to real techniques that can fill in the gap. I mean, you already have to fill in the gap 
between sim and real. Like trying to do RL training on a model, which is so accurate to the robot body that you're going to put it straight in the robot body and it's going to work. That's just unrealistic. That's, I mean, that's just something that we learned. So, you, you know, the, the standard techniques are you figure out an adapter layer inside there, which can be trained on the difference between the physical body of the actual robot that you're going to run the model in and the uh, simulated body. And, you know, so there's ways to do that. It seems to work pretty well and they'll end up doing that. So the bigger and more complicated that shim layer is, the more, you know, problems that you're going to have with it, the more, the more slack you have to build. Because another thing is like all of the RL models, they have to have a certain amount of slack built into them. There's, there are things that you just can't predict very well, realistically, you know, like exactly how much does the shag carpet move forward when you put your foot down and you're decelerating, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. So model has to have enough margin that, then the, the neural network model, which is controlling the robot actions in real time, it has to have enough margin built into it that it can deal with things that can't be seen. Now, of course, once you get into the real world, you can refine the model, you know, so that's a nice thing to be able to do. And you might be able to refine it to a particular robot body and overcome all of that kind of stuff, like if your model has enough parameters. But in the short run, you know, you take the model, you take the the electromagnetic simulation of the of the of the robot body that you're using in the sim when you do the RL training, you you put a certain amount of detail into that, and then you resign yourself to using the adapter to fill in the rest of that stuff, right? It, I mean, it, obviously, the more refinement you put into this stuff, the more sort of precision and reliability and everything you're going to get out of the out of the the behavior of the model, but I don't know if it's, if this like necessarily ranks as a big obstacle, it kind of like the machining, it's a thing that needs to be solved, but there are straightforward ways to solve it. And there's, you know, there's a long road between us and high volume manufacturing for them to like figure that out, get it nailed down and get it working really well. So, you know, it, it it's an interesting, you know, inside baseball kind of story about what's going on with the thing, but it doesn't actually say much about the long arc of of the development of this and like at what point in the future we're going to get to large volume stuff. You know, you got to work through all that stuff. James, in another interview, I heard you say that uh, you think that hardware limitations is going to be the, the 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 thing that's rate limiting versus software that eventually everybody will. I don't know if, I, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, uh, mm -hmm. software is not going to be as hard as the hardware. But then the other part was Tesla is focusing on the human hand or <laughs> the Optimus hands as modeled as mm -hmm. closely as possible human hand. You said it's a high bar for dexterity, tying mm -hmm. shoelaces, using scissors, peeling oranges. Yeah. Uh, can you just speak a little bit to, uh, you know, but like, like, does it matter that uh, Optimus might have pressure sensors and others may not go that route? And what's the value of the hands? If you want to do a drop in for so I the way I think about this is the 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 big payoff on humanoid robots is when you actually can drop them in for what humans do. I mean, it's a pretty flexible form factor for doing lots of things and it fits, you know, approximately well into all kinds of things. They're the right height, the right weight, they work at the right scale to like fit into manufacturing processes that are kind of human centric today. So that's all true. But you get a really big win when when you can drop them right into like what what humans do wouldn't uh, because then they go right into every factory. You know, you don't have to. It, it's kind of like with uh, once upon a time with uh, robo taxis, the robo taxi guys were thinking we're never going to be able to make this work unless we get them to change the roads. We need to. They need to paint the lines. They need to have the signs be in the right place. They need to have, and that is a losing proposition because nobody is going to rebuild the world to compensate for deficiencies in your technology. It's just, it's unrealistic to expect that. And so the humanoid is like that, but on a much bigger scale, right? Because there's so many things that humans drop into your plates, your dishes, you, you know, how you interact with people like, you know, there are so many hand tools that we do. There are so many tasks that are already adapted. When you get a robot that can do, that, that's got the same sort of physical envelope of capabilities that a human body has, suddenly they drop in there and suddenly, you know, the sky's the limit. There are so many things it can go into. 
if you compromise against that, even relatively minor compromises against human level functionality, they cause you to have to take all kinds of tasks off the table. Like there become huge numbers of things that your robot can't do. It can do these things, but then it can't do all these other things. So a framework for thinking about this is like, what does it take to get to what a human can do? And one of the biggest challenges in that is the hand. The hand is, an, you know, it's a mechanical marvel and it's, we didn't, you know, evolution didn't give us these crazy hands just for fun. We use them <laughs> like they're very, they're the capabilities of these hands are very important to the range of things that human beings can do. You know, they're an enabler, they're a critical enabler in order to be able to do this, but they're simultaneously very complicated mechanisms and, it, and, and they're very, they're, it's going to be really hard to build them. So probably more than almost any other, you know, subsystem of, the robot, but the mechanical aspects of the robot body, these things are going to be, these, you know, the design of the hands is going to be a limiter on the range of human tasks that the robot can do. So I used examples like, you know, building a hand that can use a set of tin snips and shovel and also pick up your baby, right? And it can do all those things well. Like that's an amazing range of like, dexterity, sensitivity, and power. Like there's a lot of I mean, human hands are actually very powerful. So getting that whole range into a, a robot hand that is also cheap and durable, <laughs> that's a trick. Like that's an amazingly, that's a, it's just the human hand set a very high bar and, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's you know, don't underestimate how hard it's going to be to do that stuff. So there are, there are some good efforts, you know, I mean, you got to start somewhere. You got to, you know, you build the first hand and you try it, you learn some stuff from it, you build the second hand and so on. We got a long way to go on the hands, right? It's, it's going to be a while before we get there. I do think that, um, you know, getting the hand right, you want, we want to be putting a lot of effort into getting the hands right, right now, because that's not going to be an easy thing to solve. Uh, I think you'll see robots come out that have approximations to human hands that can do some set of tasks and will be useful. You put them in a factory environment, you dumb it down a little bit, you give them a set of tasks and you'll get useful work out of them, right? But the robot that really can deliver your mail, wash your dishes, walk your dog, that can do all of that kind of stuff, like we're going to need to get very close to to uh, to the to the space of things that human beings can do if we want to get there. And, you know, so we got a long ways to go. Like there will be lots of useful things for robots to do in a year, in two years, in three years, as these robots get better. But the big payoff is a little bit farther down the road than that.